today we're going to talk about hardening Apache and PHP. Uh, my name's Lance Butters. Um, I'm a, s a security researcher and a software developer. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. I'm part of the DEF CON group. Um, I also help run the 801 Labs hackerspace. And that's about me. So what is har hardening? Um, I thought it would be good to uh, define hardening. My definition is basically we just want to make the system or the configuration of Apache or whatever we're trying to harden as difficult for someone trying to attack it to get, as, get any information. We'll make it difficult to get information or learn about the system or um, get past security guards. So when we talk about security, um, we always come down to confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These th three things are key in any type of security situation you're trying to um, develop. So with that being said, confidentiality, you know, if I'm talking to this guy in the green shirt and we're having a private conversation, making sure that, you know, the things that we're saying are kept between us, integrity, meaning that the information that I'm giving him is what he's actually receiving and what, I, what I'm receiving is what he's actually said, and availability is the ability for him to use my service or for my service to be available to people who need to use it. So when we talk about security principles, the first thing we want to do is we want to look for the weakest link. When you have a security architecture, if you have any, basically whatever the weakest link is is going to break the chain and bring down the whole house of cards. We want to identify the weakest link and that's the place we want to start. And once we have a place to start, we want to get in depth. So we want to add layers upon layers upon layers. Security isn't about setting a configuration and being done. Security is about creating barrier after barrier after barrier after barrier to make it more difficult for someone to attack our systems or compromise the system. How many of you are familiar with the dangerous game? All right, the dangerous game is a story about the rich safari hunting guy. He goes out and he gets bored of hunting in Africa. So he buys an island and he decides to hunt men. He decides to hunt people. And so he meets someone and he says, oh, well this is, and he shows him this is what I do is I hunt people. And he gives the guy a three hour head start and he you know, says, oh, I'm gonna hunt you. And he goes out. So what does this guy do? He runs through trails. He creates trail after trail. He creates some false leads. He creates layers upon layers. He goes through the jungle and back traces through his tracks and all this stuff. And he does all of this to avoid his pursuer. Now, with any security type of mentality, the, uh, an attack, you know, is always um, offense is the best defense. But in the, in the information security world, we can't have an offense. You can't sit there and just attack the whole world because you're pretty much against the whole world. So what you have to do is lay traps and lay layers for all of your attackers. That being said, you know, when you have layers, you also want to fail securely. So if you have a security mechanism, you want it and it stops working, it needs to shut down or provide a layer of security or maybe just halt, depending on what your risks are and how you want to mitigate those risks. And then these are just some another examples that I wanted to provide this stuff just so you can kind of have that security mentality while you're doing this because the security configurations that I'm recommending might not work in your environment and you need to think about, okay, if I allow this setting, is this going to provide risk? What, what, am, I, what am I giving up versus what am I gaining? So with that being said, when you're doing security, you always, when you apply security settings, you always want to test those settings, right? So if we make a change, we want to test that the change that we made actually provided some change or is actually working, right? Because if you have like a web, a web application firewall or you have something in place and it's not working correctly, it's not really providing security. You've just configured it and it's setting up there and it's just burning system resources. So that being said, be reluctant to trust anything, even your own configuration. Assume your secrets are not safe. So assume that your attacker knows everything about you and your environment. Assume it's like your best friend who's been watching over your head and now your enemies and now he's going after your system. That's how you should be thinking about your security architecture. 
And secondly, you need to make security usable. If it's not usable, people won't use it, right? If it's so tedious and it's so overbearing and it's just complicated and it takes forever, your users or the people that you're trying to secure are going to be your worst enemy because they're just going to go the way that's easy for them. So with this being said, well, this will be the last slide about um, kind of the theory behind this. What you want to do for your architecture is you want to create kind of a threat model. You want to get all of your assets together. You want to get all of your systems together and think about, OK, when I'm doing these security settings, how is this going to affect the entire model? And what, am I, what are my attackers? Who's trying to get to access to my resources? What's valuable in my system? What's not valuable? And what risks can I take versus which risks do I want to mitigate first? So on a website, why do attacks take place? What, what do hackers want on a website? Like just let's say you have your own WordPress site. Why do they want your WordPress site? Yeah, that's good. Fame, right? They want to, they want to, you know, boost their ego. They want to say, yeah, I got that site. I ran that vulnerability, and I got on there, and they defaced the site. Run their own programs on your site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they want to, they want to pretend to be you, right? They want to attack your system, gain control of your resources, so maybe they can go after somebody else, and that other person will think it's you. So you get the phone call at 4 a.m., and they don't. Yeah, definitely. They want to make you look bad. They attack your site, you know, like you, you have a DDoS attack, you have another vulnerability. They're like, oh, this is their peak time, and I'm their competitor, right? So if I send a ton of traffic at them at this time, I'm going to reduce the amount of people that are going to be using their site or using their product or, you know, using that service. So the different types of attacks we talked about, denial of services. They also want your site because if you have a lot of users, they're going to run phishing scams, right? They're going to try and collect information. They're going to try and attack sessions. Um, they're going to use injection flaws. They're going to try and inject into the database. They're going to try and pull data out of the database. They're going to try and put JavaScript on your site. Um, they're going to try and steal information. Um, you know, get, get as much information as they possibly can about the system. They're going to take advantage of application logic flaws. So, Another thing to think about, too, is if you've got a query or you've got a piece of code on your web server that runs really, really slow, this is a, actually a critical point where they can say, huh, I wonder if I, if I make 1,000 users on your site and I keep running that program, am I going to cause the system to go to an absolute crawl? Another thing is if I do things out of order on your system, like if you have an application where I have to do step one, step two, step three, if I go to step three and I go back to step one and then I skip to step three, am I going to cause errors? Am I going to cause problems? Or am I going to get access to something that I shouldn't be able to have access to because I didn't follow form three? So those are things to think about. Another attack is this, the path transversal. And this is basically you exposing information that you didn't realize that was valuable. Because when developers are developing, they're on, they have their web server set up. They've got their install files, all the other stuff. Maybe they've got their own personal information. Maybe they put their contact information. You know, um, maybe that might be valuable for recruiters or somebody. You know, someone might want that information, and if it is exposed on the web server, they might be able to pull it. So, let's get into Apache. So, first of all, who's running Apache? Good. Figured, should be. Um, we're going to talk about Apache. Nginx is good too, but I use Apache, and the main reason I use Apache, I'll talk about it later, is because of its support of mod security. Um, Nginx doesn't have great support yet. You have to actually compile Nginx and then compile mod security, and it's just a bunch of work. So it's just for right now, I'm using Apache mostly. So the first thing is, is should Apache run as root? No. No. Why do we not do that? What's wrong with that? Why it seems reasonable, right? We don't, because if the, if Apache gets compromised, if this gets compromised, then that person has root access. They own your system, right? So anything Apache does, it has. A, if it was running as root, it could do anything, right? It's you at that point. So if there's a PHP vulnerability or an attack or a, a buffer overflow in Apache. 
someone gets that, then now they have complete control of their system. They can do everything you want. At this point, this is where we call owned, right? I have root access. The system's owned. There's nothing I can't do on it. So the first, very first thing we want to do is run Apache as a least privileged user. It doesn't have to be Apache. You can create a different user. And then what you want to do is, is take the Apache user and make their, the Apache configuration readable only by root. And the uh, by root and uh, the Apache user itself, yeah, or, or just by the by root. I think it can still read the files through that if you have it uh, read only, but you don't want to have it write. So this is this is a bare bones. Like if you were to blow away your Apache configuration by default, this is the bare bones default secure configuration. We're just serving up one directory. We're denying everything, and we're not doing indexing. We're not allowing overrides. We're not allowing HT access files. We're going to build upon that. So if you're not familiar with the options directive, it gives you a bunch of different options of what can actually be accomplished inside that directory, the inside that directive. By default, we have all. So it means it allows all options listed below except the multi-views. You know, if, if there's nothing here that we need, we want to set it to none. I mean, here's, who's using CGI scripts? All right, so why do we have CGI enabled, right? A lot of Apache configs, they, they kind of have it enabled, but they have the mod, they have everything ready to go for CGI scripts, except maybe, you know, the options directive. So if we're not using it, let's get rid of it. You know, not use the exclude and all that stuff. Uh, we want to get rid of indexes. If we're not indexing, it's not use. I mean, if we're not doing a file share, why should we use indexes? Who who can tell me what indexes do? What does index do on the web server? Yeah, list all the files in an empty directory, right? So if you have an image folder, it'll list all of your image folders, all of your image files in that folder. So we want to turn this off. Why, why do we care if someone can see all of our images, right? What's wrong with that? Yeah, they can see your folder structure. They could link to those images. There might be images in there that, that you didn't want exposed or maybe you're, you're working on. Or maybe you don't want all of your site content. I mean, that's expensive, right? You know, have a developer or have some a designer make all that stuff. You don't want someone to just like, oh, I'll just steal all this stuff and use it on my own site, right? Make it a little bit more difficult for them to use. Um, another thing you'll see common is, is symbolic links um, for directories. If you don't need symbolic links, just you know, don't use it. Still use the none option if you have to use symbolic links, do the sim links if owner matches. Basically what that means is this, the folder that it's linked to has to be owned by Apache. If it starts in the Apache and then it goes to a symbolic link, that folder has to be owned by Apache. This can help prevent um, full, uh, path transversal. So if I can do backslash backslash and try and get lower into a non-web um, published directory. If you can, you want to use mod alias. Mod alias does the same thing as symbolic links. Um, it just says, okay, this this a, this this URL or this directive is as actually in this location. It's a little bit more secure. I provided some information on that. Um, another misconception is everyone loves .ht access files, right? Yes. Yep. They make life easier, not secure. Unfortunately, anything you can do in a .ht access file, you can do in the Apache config, and you should. Um, the only time you should really be using .ht access files is when you have a shared system or a distributed system, and you you know you don't want to manage their configuration. Which, if you're running a really secure server, you don't want to run multiple resources on the same system. Um, we you know it comes back to our security philosophy. If we have two critical items, the best thing is not to put them in the same basket because we don't want them a compromise of one to affect the compromise of ever, uh, the other, especially if they have no interlinking connections themselves. So with that being said, you know, you want to, if you have .ht access files, they actually do cost system resources, having it turned on in that directory. 
because every time you do a requ request, it's looking for that .ht access file, and it's actually eating resources too. So you get a little bit of a performance boost by just not using them and putting the config in the Apache directives, or the Apache configuration files. Um, so the allow override directive basically affects just all the HT access stuff, um, and it controls what you can do and what you can't do with the HT access files. Again, like I said, if you're using them, um, try not to. So that goes over kind of the basic configuration. So now what we're going to talk about is the information leakage. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn off all of the identifiers to identify all of the things that um, show that our, our web server is running on a Linux. This is from Apache Config. There's still system parameters that you need to configure to do that, but that's a whole other talk. So what we're doing is we're turning off sig uh, server signatures, so we're not going to tell people what version of Apache we're using. We're going to do production only. We're going to set the server name to the um, actual um, name of the site. We're going to turn trace off. Who here knows what trace does? Okay, trace is actually part of the HTTP protocol. And what it does is if I send you a trace HTTP request, you will, the trace will actually send me back the request. So I can see, you know, this is the request the web server received, and this is the one that I sent. So I can compare differences. So if there's a load balancer, if there's something in the way, I can see how it's being changed and affected by the web server. So that's a debugging feature. It's on by default on Apache, so it's something you want to turn off. You want to set your server admin configuration to an email address. You can just have it go to a black hole. But making this change kind of tells something to someone kind of fingerprinting or looking at your system. It shows that this person has actually spent the time to care about setting these configuration options. So they probably have more options that they're setting and probably taking a look at their server. So it makes the person that, that would be thinking about attacking the system a little wary and a little harder to identify what the system actually is. So we're talking about HTTP headers, um, and the yellow is my request, and then the green is the response. So this is without those settings. As you can see, um, the date setting kind of gives the system away, but here it says Apache version 2.215 CentOS last modified, and so that's giving away my operating system and my Apache version. Two things that I just you don't want to tell attackers or tell someone who might be doing malicious things to your system. Uh, additionally, um, you want to reject certain file types. So if you're not serving a certain type of file type, you want to configure um, a rejection on it. So like your Git files, especially your SVN files, you don't want someone downloading all your source code for on the back end server and reading it, right? So you want to make sure that you're not exposing, you know, .svn, .git. Um, you don't want to serve, you don't want people being able to run HT files. Basically, any, if you're not serving it, you should probably put a file restriction on it just as a fail safe so that those files don't leave your system. Uh, and then you want to remove default content. Uh, CentOS by default has a welcome page. The first thing you should do on a new setup is just turn it off. So go into the configuration and comment everything out and turn it off. So with the basic um, Apache configuration, you can't change the header return to not beyond Apache without modifying the source code. So I personally don't think it's a great idea to compile Apache from source. I mean, it's something you can do securely if you spend the time doing it. But I'm, I'm sure a lot of people just, that's time better spent elsewhere. So one thing you can do with uh, mod security, and we'll talk about installing mod security, which is a web application firewall, is you can change that header information to whatever you want. So we can say, oh, tell them that I'm Microsoft IS 5.0, right? Let them, let them think that. So they'll see that, and it's, it's funny, because you, 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 some people will configure it to some funny things, but if you throw the wrong thing, that's a rabbit hole, right? That's a path to say, hey, go down this wrong path. That's a loop. If we go back to the dangerous game of the guy running around in the jungle, he's like, oh, I'm down here. And you go down here, and you're like, wait a minute. This is weird. This isn't where, there's no, there's no more evidence. Or like, it just doesn't make sense, right? It's just something to throw people off. 
Another thing you need to do um, is go through your Apache modules. So this, I went through this a little bit myself because I was like, oh, I'm going to go read them all, and then I got really bored really fast. So on your, on your production systems, you need to go through, and this is another thing you need to test, is you go through, I've listed, the, this link here has uh, all the Apache modules, and you need to go through and decide, okay, do I actually, am I using this Apache module? Because it's nothing to just comment out, and if you need it, you can comment it back in, right, and restart the service. But removing um, these modules, like we said, CGI bin, why do I need CGI bin? It's just, I'm loading it, I'm taking up memory, it's there, it's an attack vector, you know, we had the shell shock vulnerability come out. There's no reason to, you know, no one's really using CGI, so let's just get rid of it. If you're not using WebDAV, you don't have SVN on the same server that you're running um, your code on, turn WebDAV off. Not using LDAP, turn it off. Let's, let, let's, let's reduce the attack vector by reducing the amount of code we're executing and the amount of code that we have on our system. <coughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about shrouding. Shrouding was kind of the old, the old Wild West way of securing um, processes. Basically what shrouding would it'd be, it would give the user or the process this view of isolation that like, oh, you only have access to these files, you're in this directory, you don't have the full operating system. And to accomplish this, what you do is you use the LDD command, which is the linker, and it identifies all of the, f the programs and all the libraries that this process is using. So you can call, so here I'm calling LDD on bash, because I'm going to put bash in its own um, shrouded directory. So I look, I get all the, the libraries there, then I make a shrouded directory, I copy all the libraries over, and, I sh and then I copy um, bash over, and then here I'm calling shroot, shroot, bin, bash. And so at this point, I have a shrouded, um, isolated environment so the process can run in isolation. Um, now, if you do this, you get all the libraries and you still have errors. There's really, it's really difficult to troubleshoot, so you can use strace um, to troubleshoot shrouding, a shrouded um, environment. And what that does is it just tells you all the processes and all the kernel calls that the process is using while it's running. So you can go through like, oh, maybe I missed the library or I missed the link or something I'm not seeing. So that'll be something that you want to put in your Sharuta directory. So with that being said, so I did LDD on the Apache process because like, all right, I'm going to try Sharuting Apache just because it seemed like fun at the time, right? Well. I started doing that. It was a huge pain. I was like, well, is this even secure? I started thinking about it because this is, because when I was growing up, this I always heard, oh, you got to shroot it. If you want it secure, it has to be shrouded. Well, shroot wasn't made to be a security mechanism. It was meant to just have process isolation. So if you had a process that you want to separate it from everything else and you want to have it isolated, that's what shroot was. And someone saw, oh, this shrouding method's awesome because if someone gets into the process, they only have access to these files, and because they're not the root user, they shouldn't be able to get to other processes, right? Well, there's actually some way workarounds on that, and shrouding's actually considered not secure anymore and probably not um, a good pra security practice anymore. What people recommend is that you, you just basically you configure security Linux correctly which I did, a, I did a lot of Google searching for that because I've, I've run security Linux and I, you know, you always hit that point where you just, oh, I just got to disable it because I, I just have to have this thing to work. So I, I've provided some links here, but it's worth it to go through the pain of learning how to get security Linux working correctly. If you think about it, com that compared to shrouding, SE Linux is a little bit more secure. And from my understanding that the GR security is actually better than SC Linux, I haven't used GR security. I've, I'm looking into it, so it's another thing to think about. All right, so we've covered most of Apache. Now we're going to talk about PHP INI config. Um, this is for PHP I, uh, 5. And these are all, this is basically all of the security settings that you want in your INI file. Um, safe mode basically is just kind of like the, uh, the symlink thing, where it says, okay, this, this, process, this file is owned by Apache, and I'm running Apache, and so it needs to match, you know, the users need to match, Apache and the PHP file need to match. Same with the group. 
F open, allow URL F open. Who's familiar with this? Yeah, you've been bitten by it, right? F open lets you open a URL. So if you have a parameter in your query in your request that then is then interpreted by F open, you now have a proxy that can load PHP code from anywhere in the world that it has access to which is a big security problem, right? So by default, I'm never going to use URL F open, so I turn it off. I set the open base directory. This is basically where you want the PHP script to think where their working directory is, so where it's executing. Uh, turn off globals. If you're, if you're not using PHP globals, turn them off. They're a security concern, because you, you know, the scope kind of helps protect the code itself. Uh, you want to disable functions. Um, basically, there are a ton of PHP functions that are just big security holes. My favorite is PHP eval. What does PHP eval do? Yeah, it interprets whatever you pass it as PHP code. Why this thing was invented, I'm not certain. I guess someone thought it would be cool or it's a great idea to load PHP code from a database and interpret it or for parameters. The problem is, is PHP eval, if you have parameters coming in from the user space and it gets interpreted by eval, there's a possibility that the user can manipulate the input where they can get the PHP code running. So if you're not using eval, you can't think of a good reason to use it, turn it off. Say, OK, here's a list of functions. I'm just going to get rid of these functions, disable them. We don't need to use them. They're big security concerns. Uh, the Should that be like a comma separated list? Um, I've got a full list here, actually. So it's just, yeah, comma. This is my list of things that I just went through. I'm like, these are things I don't need. Any other questions? Sorry. OK. Um, so an enable DL is dynamic um, loading of modules. You just turn it off um, because it can be taken advantage of. Uh, file uploads. So are you doing, who here does file uploads? OK. So if you need the functionality, turn it on, right? If you don't need the functionality, why, why bother, right? File uploads are a good place for me as an attacker because as soon as I find a vulnerability on your system, I'm going to go look for a file upload because I'm going to want my web, that's how I'm going to get my web shell on your system. I have a question on that. Mm -hmm. If you're not uploading it into the file system, but you're uploading it into the database, is that still, uh, in other words, I'm not throwing it out in a directory, I'm having put it in the data. Um, in that case, probably it would be more difficult for me to take advantage of it. Yeah, that at that time because if you're if you're uploading it, and you're you're not you're just putting it like a bit stream into the the database. Yeah, that would probably. Um, yeah, to do any type of file uploading to have the the PHP interpret the file upload parameters from the HTTP request. You have to have file uploading on. Now, that, with that being said, if you have to have file uploads, you want to set, you know, you want to set the temp directory. Well, it would depend. Does it? I guess it creates a temp file too, right? Does the temp file get wiped? I'm converting going to PHP from kernel, so right now mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Okay, I'd have to. It's been a little while since I've looked at it, but from my perspective as an attacker. What I'll do is like if I if I find a SQL vulnerability because you know usually the database and the web server are separate, so what I'll will do is if I can if I can't manipulate the database and what I'll do is I'll look for information leakage and I'll try and get credentials, so I'll try and steal your user login information and once I'm logged in as a user I'm going to look for a file upload feature, because at that point I'm going to try and bypass the security on the file load upload feature to try and get a web shell where I can actually get execution and, and uh, code on your system that you didn't put there yourself. So like that being said, um, if you don't need file uploads, turn them off. They're on by default. And if you do need file uploads, try and figure out how big the files you want. The smaller, the better. 
Um, the really small makes it really difficult and really limits the type of files that an attacker can upload if they, if they compromise the system. Additionally, um, you want to log all errors, but you don't want to display errors because display errors are good for your developers. They're also good for your, for your attackers because, oh, if I do this, I get this error. If I do this, I get this error. So this means I need to fix this portion of my, my request and maybe it will actually execute. Or if I'm getting no response, it's like, well, I'll just have to throw things against the wall and hopefully something will stick. So um, another thing is, is your PHP session management. Your PHP session will give away that you're actually using PHP. You'll, um, I forgot to put this in here, but you also want to configure your system so that you're not you know, exposing it by doing .php, you know, telling people what you're actually using. But if you want to hide it further, you've got to hide the PHP session ID and changing that in the PHP INI config. Um, so that way that they, don't, they have to guess at what you're actually using. So to do that, you just go to the session name and you just, ch here I changed it to session ID. You could change it to J, J session ID. Ugh. Um, and that way, like, oh, maybe they're using Java. I don't know. It's like we're, we're confusing them, right? Um, the session, the session save path. Is another thing you want to configure. This is where the sessions are going to be saved by default by PHP. You want to set your session to HTTP only, cookie only, um, and then refer. You want to put your name in there, your domain name in there. Cookie lifetime to zero, so that means that once the once the browser closes, the cookie is destroyed. And then we say uh, secure. And HTTP only, and I completely forgot which HTTP only means because it's not it's not SSL, but I think it means it has to be from the same request or something. But anyway, if you if you're confused by the settings, I provided a link here, and I'll publish the slides and then just go over the details in that. So then we have our these are my lists of dangerous functions, and we have execute. A um, bunch of postfix, uh, postfix stuff to do operating system stuff. PHP info. PHP info is a big information leakage. You look at it once and you're done with it. Why leave it on? Just turn it off. All right. So we have our PHP configuration. We have our HTTP configuration. So the next thing we want to do is configure SSL. If you've never configured an, uh, an SSL certificate, these are kind of all the things you need to do. And I provided a link. I'm not going to go over this in detail because there's a lot of good guides out there to how to do your self-signing cert and how to do a um, cert request and send it to your CA. And this isn't a talk about uh, PKI. But one common mistake I see a lot is people leave their, their private key world readable. Why is this bad? Well, what, what can I do if your private key is world readable? Yeah, if I can get the key, I can decrypt all your traffic, right? If it's world readable and you have a vulnerability, a path transversal vulnerability, because you have, you know, your sim, you have something sim linked incorrectly, and I can get to that file and it's world readable, I now have your private key. Now all I have to do is capture your your web traffic, and now I can decrypt everything that's going through. So the SSL is just burning CPU cycles. So this is a, a another configuration that I think a lot of people just kind of, they, they turn SSL on and like, oh great, I'm, I'm protected. Well, with a lot of the SSL vulnerabilities that have come out recently, um, SSL is actually deprecated. It's actually TLS now. I really should have written it something else. So they're, they're saying with all the vulnerabilities, SSL 3 is gone. You're supposed to be using TLS 1.2, um, CentOS 5 supports up to TLS 1.0. CentOS 6 does support 1.2. But um, if you have any questions about your SSL configuration, SSL lab or slash SSL test will go through and test the security of your configuration. And um, with that, these are all the configurations you would need to get a passing, well, mostly passing grade. So I have RC4 in red, you need that if you want to support Internet Explorer 6. Yay, Internet, Explorers. Internet Explorer 6. If you don't care, get rid of it. 
we get a passing grade. And so what we're doing here is we are honoring the cipher order. So the, what this does is when SSL starts up, they go, oh, do you support the cipher? Yeah, I support it. Here, let's use that. What this does is it, so the, the server says, hey, do you support this? This is the most secure cipher. Or this is the one I want to use first. And the client says, no. Then it keeps going down the list until it finds the best cipher that it can use. And the cipher is just basically what, um, what it uses to encrypt the data between the, the public key information. And if you're, like, if you're curious about how this stuff works, there's plenty of information online. But with that being said, so with the SSL protocol, I'm setting all. So I'm enabling all, and I'm turning off SSL version 2 and SSL version 3. Um, if you want to get more secure, you can say TLS 1.2. With the same way, and just add a plus sign like you have with your SSL version three. That will, and then you just say that's all I support. That's the most secure version. Um, I think there's issues with TLS 1.0. Um, I've heard. I haven't looked into them. Then, if you want to check your SSL cert yourself, you can use this Open SSL S client host. And this will actually tell you all the security settings on a, a SSL server. Does anybody have questions on this? I think this is this is important, so I want to make sure that you guys understand what I'm saying. We good? So with that being said, if you're using SSL and you have SSL um, required content, you want to make sure you we, we go back to failing safe. We want to make sure that this content that we're protecting by SSL, if it gets misconfigured or if something goes wrong, or they try and use it through HTTP that they can't access it through HTTP, they have to use SSL. So we tell it to fail safe. And we tell it to we put permanent redirects on there. We use rewrites. Here's some examples. Again, these are useful SSL commands um, for checking certificates and other things, just so you have a resource and a reference. All right, so we're going to talk about some fun stuff. So, an attacker, denial of service attacks. Who's familiar with a sin flood? What is a sin flood? Basically, it just keeps asking for sins and doesn't mm -hmm. react. So yep. Come back from the server. So it's like a bunch of if you have a counter and let's say you have three people there helping customers, it's like having and you had sixty people come up and say hello. Say, hey, how can I help you? And then you have another person come up, hey, hello, oh, hey, I'm helping this other guy. And this other guy comes, hello. They don't say anything else. They just keep having people coming up and talking to that person and interrupting him or having him eat resources. And what that does is it eats up all of the resources that Apache has, it, has allocated to it. And it grinds the system to a halt and stops traffic from moving. So if you want to simulate, you can use h3ping or hping3 to simulate a sin flood. You can even spoof the, spoof the address. So because we're sending a send packet and the way TCP IP connections work, we can just send this packet and we don't really check the source and I don't really care about getting the response because I'm just sending you people, I'm sending you requests just so that it eats resources. If you're under a DDoS attack, you can use these IP table configuration um, to kind of limit the amount of send requests you're getting. It's not ideal for production, but it can help mitigate the attack. Um, and then if you know the IP address, like if they're, if they're being sloppy and using their own IP address or they're using the same IP address, um, you can set in blocks in that, you know, in your IP tables on the system. So what's, what's the difference between a denial of service and a distributed denial of service? The distributed, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Distributed is where you have like a botnet, so a lot of computers will use this to leverage your attack against a single uh, victim. Yes, yeah, so denial of just uh, distributed denial of service is when you've really made someone angry. It's like when they have a whole botnet, they have a whole they have a whole army of computers sending you requests. So, and then that can be very difficult to protect against. You can put security settings, but basically with that, their goal is probably to just flood your network connection. Like if you have a 10 meg pipe and you have 100 megs of data coming through, it's just gonna grind to a halt. So that's a network layer um, that you would have to do. And just basically having a lot of bandwidth and having a lot of load balancing and distributing can protect against that. But this is, they spend a lot of money protecting against denial of service, distributed denial of service attacks. 
So, reflection DDoS attack. This is where I send a request to someone else saying that I'm you. I send a request to someone else and I'm saying it's like me, it's like me mailing someone a bunch of return letters with your address on them and people are like, oh, this isn't me, and then they send it back to sender, right? Well, the sender is you, so now you're getting all of this mail from all over the world, from all kinds of different places towards your server or your mailbox or your service. And the, the most famous attack on this is an NTP, uh, NTP attack because NTP is UDP based. You send a request to an NTP server, hey, what time it is? What's the time? And then it sends it back, oh, this is the time. Well, if I find a ton of servers that will do that to me and they'll send it to any server that I say in the uh, return address, I can then send an attack and say, oh, these 10,000 servers, what time is it? And they say, oh, they go back, oh, who, is this? who said this? And they, they find that server and they said, hey, here's all your response. And it all comes back, hits the server, causes congestion. It's a good attack, right? Because I'm telling someone else to do something for me and they don't even know they're doing it. So the guy that configured his NTP server has no idea and he's getting all these phone calls and he's like, oh, I guess I better do something about that. So then again, you have brute force attacks where basically they're just trying to get against your authentication. They're trying to just ping your server, just trying to get as much information as they can off your system. And then you have the, another DDoS attack is poorly designed, poorly designed web applications or processes. If you have a really tedious, terrible SQL query and it's part of your web application and I call it from one user and I call it from another user and I call it, and I have a bunch of people call it, now I've just eaten up all your system resources and I've stopped your system from working. So another great module that Apache has is called Mod Evasive and it helps prevent against DDoS attacks and it's got um, it's got some pretty neat tools with it. Uh, that's how you install it. Um, basically, you can get an email every time it's like, hey, I think this guy is uh, DDoSing your system. You can get an email. Um, you can configure all of the page count intervals and all this other stuff. And you can have it run an IP ban. So you can say, oh, I'm going to ban this guy maybe for 30 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever you want. So we have the hash table keeps track of the activity of a per IP base. Increasing the size will you know, make it slower, but provide you know, a little bit better detection. We have page count, site count, a bunch of other, and then we have the blocking period. So this is the mod evasive script, and this is the, the link that I got this script from. What this will do is it'll just add the uh, drop for two hours, the IP to a drop table for two hours if someone's trying to send a ton of requests. This is also good too if someone's trying to brute force or trying to crawl your website because it's going to slow them down. It's like if I can only get small portions of information every two hours, it's going to be a lot harder for me to poke and prod at your configuration in your application. And then this is the, the file edit you have to um, do to the sudo file to allow Apache to run um, the script to ban people. So with that being said, there's things that you're going to want to kind of configure. One of them is the timeout setting. So like, so it, by default, Apache lets the, the connection sit in system resources for 300 seconds. So if we go back to that send flood attack, so I, open, I start a connection or I start a process, it's going to wait 300 seconds before it dies. Um, the other settings are just kind of the basic stuff that's, that's set for a while. You can adjust this to how you want. Like if you don't want to use Keep Alive, you know, you don't want to keep connections the same, you can turn that off. Um, you put configuration limits. So this again is affected by the file upload and other features. But, you know, basically you want to limit the size of request bodies. Like if someone's sending you a request, do you need a 3 gig post request? right well the limit's two gig but do you need a two gig limit no not really i mean because a lot of times you could probably fit all that requests data under 64k maybe bigger maybe smaller um, limit the number of fields and the header size if they're sending a ton of headers you know other things they could do to attack your system 
Um, with this being said, it's kind of um, I'm going to touch on multiprocessing modules. Um, basically, this is how Apache forks and handles multiple requests at the same time. Um, there's a bunch of information here. I, record, I copied the link twice, looks like. But so we have our settings. So you want to tweak this for your, your performance, right? You want to allow more, you might want to allow more, you might want to allow less, depending on how much traffic you're allowing and how much, you know, maybe you're under attack. So you're like, okay, let's give Apache more resources. Um, these are all of the MPM settings. So you can add more clients or decrease the clients, you know, the maximum number of clients at any given time that are actually connected to your system. Um, you can increase that if you're under attack and you want to try and maybe hopefully you can get some other people in there, but maybe it'll also cause the system to crawl or you could reduce it so their attack's less effective. Just other things to think about. So with security, we wouldn't have security if we didn't have logging. How many people read their logs? Every day, every month? Well, the cool thing about Apache is it has a common log format so you can customize it. If you're doing any type of security and you're not looking at your log file, then you know the whole point of this is probably mute. I mean, doing all these security settings because your log file is going to tell you who's accessing your systems and who's using them and what they're doing on your system, right? You can give you a better idea of what's going on. So it's always good to... Um, look at the Apache logs. You can customize the Apache logs, so if you want to look at something specific, um, you can use the custom log directive to create a log that just says, oh, I just want to look for this. And again, the error log has everything that the access log doesn't. So, more fun stuff. Who here has used a web application firewall? What does a web application firewall do? Looks at what traffic? Hmm? Yep, looks at HTTP traffic. So what this does is this, a lot of people think that web, web application firewalls are kind of useless. If you're a good developer, you don't need one, right? And if you never make a mistake, you don't need it. But if you make a mistake, well, this might actually help you. So this is just another layer that we're going to put in line um, with the application. And so Apache has mod security, and mod security is actually a really awesome security tool. And what mod security does is it looks at the request and it has a list of rules and says like these are patterns of attacks and then these are you know valid requests and says well this one looks like possibly like a attack. But depending, and it'll do, it'll do different ratios and things like, oh, well, maybe it's not an attack, but if it keeps seeing things that look like attack, then it'll block the, I, block, the, block the requesting IP address and send back 403, which is awesome if someone's trying to do SQL injection or cross-site scripting injection or any other type of things. Now, this isn't a replacement for secure coding, but if you have a, if you have a really bad, terribly coded application that you have to run, I extremely recommend turning on mod security for that application to protect it, especially if you know if there's um, SQL injection vulnerabilities inside of it, because it'll help prevent that. Now, it's not foolproof. Um, with, with that being said, there are, ways, there are advanced ways of getting past these filters, which is a little bit beyond this presentation. But with that being in place, it's now a lot it's very difficult for an attacker to get past your you know, mod security and they have to put a lot more effort into um, attacking. So anyway, the configuration is you just do yum install mod security, you load this log, the mod security module, you make a directory for the security rules, um, you include that directory, and then you go download the mod security OWASP rules. These rules are free, provided to you by Spider Labs. They maintain it. They also have premium services, so you can buy premium, more up-to-date rules. But they're, the base core rule set's pretty good by itself. So if you don't have any protection in place, this is a great tool to use. Mm-hmm. 
a lot of times you can find mob security rules on the internet and you can drop in. Yeah. Super, super handy. So like uh, Devin was saying, that mod security can help you prevent data leakage and it can, um, if there's a mod security rule, like if there's an O-Day for like WordPress, let's say, or Drupal or some other thing, you can write rules, you can download the mod security rules and have them in place and that'll protect your system. So with that being said, if you have a if you have a pre-existing application and you want to run it in production, I remember I recommend um, turning the sec engine uh, on to just detection detection mode because with this you're going to have a lot of false positives. So you don't want to block legitimate traffic. So you turn on to detection mode at first and look at all of the okay this this one's actually a false positive or yeah this one's an attack. You get all of those out of the way, and then you turn it on. So that's what the sec engine on rule does. And what we're telling it to do is uh, ac to look at the request body and the re response body. So we're looking at traffic coming in and the traffic going out. So you could actually write rules in the mod security configuration to say, well, this, this piece of data looks a lot like a social security number. Better not send that out, right? Or this this part looks a lot like credit card data. Maybe I need to flag it and you know make make a warning file about that. Access body. You can also check mine type stuff like that. Set the data. So we talked about the sec rule engine. So we put it in detection only at first before you start running it. So we'll have some fun. Who can tell me what this code does? Yep. So what this script does is this is this is yeah the, this these lines of code completely destroy all of your security on your system. So all that work we've done yep. So at first we say we're going to just change no login because Apache's running is no login. We're going to say oh wait a minute, you actually do have a bash terminal. And so we're going we're gonna to copy no login so we can actually run commands. We're going to turn the WW data, but you know, depending on the system, this is for Ubuntu. If we were using CentOS, probably the Apache user. We're going to put them in the sudo users file. So, because, yeah, full access, right? Then we're going to grip the shadow user um, for the HTTP data f user. And then we're going to replace his password with what password we, we want to know because we want to get root. We want to log in as that user. Then we're going to destroy all of the access logs and then link the access log to null, dev null. So all their logging is going to go straight into the garbage can, gone forever. We're going to disable IP tables. We're going to let everything in and everything out. And then once we're done doing all of this, we're going to go through every single PHP file on the system and insert a backdoor. So now I can run a PHP get request and run PHP code on this system. And then after that, clear the history. Nothing like nothing ever happened. So how would you protect against this? Let's say this is an attack that like is if I had root access or if I had quick access, I just download the script and run it. Now I have full access on your system. How would you detect this? How would you know all of your code just had a backdoor inserted into it? File system integrity checks to know. Yes. File system integrity monitoring. How many people run how many people have a file check on all of their PHP code they're running on their server? So at that point, I mean, how? Do, so let's say you had a compromise like this. How would you know which files were compromised? How did you? How would you know the code that's running versus the code that you had originally? What What would be the difference? 
Well, the tool that, that's free and easy to use, and it's, a, it's kind of a dumb solution, but I always recommend doing this, is there's a program called AID, and what AID will do is it'll go through the entire operating system and create an MD5 hash of all the files and create an, a, a database. So as soon as you set up a new server, or as soon as you've got a system and you've got it exactly the way you want it, you love it, the code's running, you know you've got a fresh copy of the code, or you have a version from your repository that you're running, you create an A database, and what do you do? You take that A database and you store it off of the server, right? Because if I see, if I'm an attacker and I see there's an A database on the system, what am I going to do? I'm going to rerun the A to init script, and I'm going to go through and redo the file integrity monitoring. So when you do your check, like, oh, everything's the, the same. So once you have your system exactly the way you want it, you have everything configured good and secure, go through and run a file integrity monitoring, and then take that file and store it somewhere away from the system. This is the, one of the best security features you can do for yourself because when you have a compromise, you can, run, you can upload that A database and run this check, and you can say, oh, all of these files are compromised. I better replace them. Or, oh, the operating system is just completely hosed. Maybe I should just you know, pull the good configs, the ones that I know are config, and like, oh, it used to be this, and now it's this. You know, you can see what they changed and see what they've done to your system, and you can have a better view of how bad the damage was. If you had event, if you didn't have the file integrity monitoring, what you know, what would you do if your system got compromised? Like, if someone snuck a back door in one of your files, how would you find it? You'd have to go through every single file and check, right? Sometimes they're dumb enough; they don't set dates back and things. So yeah. You see Mm -hmm. it's, it's still a lot of checking, right? Like if they change the date, then you wouldn't it's have much to go on. Yeah. Get the get, right, yeah. Yeah, AIDS not super intelligent, and it's kind of a really archaic tool. There's other tools, but they're just a lot more complex. They're they're so more like complex, yeah. yeah more Tripwire, there's, there's AIDS just really easy and simple, so I recommend people use it, especially because like I don't know, like if you're in a huge enterprise environment, AIDS probably not the best solution. Um, but if you're, if it's just you at your house and you just want to check your file integrity, AID's great because you just run the script, save the AID config file, then you have something to reference. All right. Um, so this is a lot of the story, A lot of this data that I've gotten from this presentation came from this feisty duck book. It's a little bit out of date, but it's got a lot of good information in it. It was kind of my inspiration for this presentation. And there's a bunch of other links for my sources. And that is it. Thank you.